Give the Lord a praise all over the building tonight. Oh, come on, National Church, you can do better than that. Give the Lord a praise tonight. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. How many blessed people do we have in here tonight? If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, if you recognize it's a miracle for you to be here tonight, if you dressed yourself and nobody had to comb your hair, nobody had to set you up in your seat today, if you brought yourself out to the house of the Lord today, you ought to just take a minute. I know you're dressed up and you look real cute, but you ought to take just a moment and say, God, I thank you. God, I praise you. Somebody grateful, give him the glory right where you are and honor the Lord tonight. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I honor the invincible, immutable, everlasting, eternal spirit of God. It is a privilege to be in this house surrounded by my brothers and sisters in the faith. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I am so honored to be here uh, in this great convocation. Honor and esteem respect to his eminence, Bishop Charles E. Blake. Would you give God praise for the presiding prelate of the Church of God in Christ? Come on. He's God's son. He's my friend. Come on, let's celebrate him tonight. We respect you, sir. We thank God for the general that leads the way and commands the troops and to the first and second presiding bishops, Bishop P.A. Brooks and Bishop Jerry Macklin. Let's thank God for them as well. Hallelujah. The former presiding bishop, Bishop Chandler Owens, whereas Bishop, but there he is. God bless you. It's such a blessing to be uh, in the service with you. My, um, the kids, they used to say, they probably say something else when you're from the same place. They say you was my homie, Bishop Noel Haynes from Dallas, Texas. Thank God for him. Hey, everything good comes out of Texas. Say amen. Anybody in here from Texas make some noise tonight. And to the general secretary, Bishop Lowes, and to Bishop Sheard, the chairman of the board of bishops, and to Mother Willie Mae Rivers, thank God for you tonight. So grateful. To the First Lady, Lady Mae Blake, we thank God for you. What a blessing it is to see you in the service of the Lord. And to my own First Lady, would you help me once more appreciate Sister Sarita Jakes. She's my lady, my wife, my girlfriend, my other woman, my secret keeper, my midnight rendezvous the red heart on my chitlins, the cornbread in my grains. One more time, thank God for the lady. 27 years we've been hanging out and going strong. Can you say amen? I thank God for my friend, Lady Louise Patterson. Thank God for you. What a tremendous vessel of honor. And to all of God's generals, I've got so many friends in here, Bishop J. Delano Ellis and Bishop Daryl Hines and Bishop Drew Sheard and Dr. Ivy Hilliard flew up here tonight. Lady Hilliards and I just so I better stop calling names. I'm gonna get in trouble. And uh, Pastor Jamal Bryant and just just on and on and on. I don't. I'm not worried about preaching tonight because if I drop this mic, it's so many preachers in here to take it over. It'll be trouble in here tonight. Say amen, somebody. It's nice to have some backup, isn't it? I want to mention to you that somewhere out in the appropriate area, I've got some material. I just wrote this book called Before You Do, Making Decisions You Won't Regret. Have you ever made a decision and regretted it? Said if I could do it all over again, I would do things differently. Amen. I want to show you how to make the kinds of decisions you won't regret. I'm too old to do something stupid now. I'm running out of time. I got to get this second half right. I did some crazy stuff on the first half, but now I know y'all never did anything crazy, but I did some crazy things in my life, but now I got to make it count. And so I've put this book out and the Lord has really blessed it. It's been on the New York Times bestsellers list for quite some time. And I believe that it is there not because of shrewd marketing, but because we're living in a time today that we want people to make the right choices. I talk to single people about 20 things you should know about somebody before you marry them. 
that, that dating will not tell you. Uh, of course, nobody's single in here, but if there was somebody single in here, they'd make some noise because single people, you might be lonely, but if you're going to be lonely, be by yourself. There's nothing worse than being lonely beside somebody because you made the wrong choice. I want to help you out in here. Talk to me, somebody. It's some married folk that know I'm right, but they can't say nothing because they sitting beside a mistake and they just, they just got to keep looking straight ahead. But, but I have no condemnation in my soul. I can preach it and not be afraid. Share some things about married people. You feel like giving up. Before you do, you need to read this book. Before you buy a house, before you have children, any major decision, it will really bless you. Got it on audio as well and got it in a preaching series and all sorts of things that I believe will be a blessing to you. My goodness, I just want to look around a minute. Y'all do this all the time, but this is my first time being at the National Church of God in Christ. I just want to look at you for a minute. It's not only that I've never preached here, but Dr. Campbell, God bless you. See, I keep, every time I turn, I see somebody I know and love. It's not only the first time I preach, it's the first time I've ever been here. And I've learned something already. I've learned something already. Yesterday, we had a book signing. I learned not to have a book signing at your national convention. Because my arm is still hurting. I signed my name so long that when I was laying in the bed last night, I was still signing my sheets and pillowcases. And Lord, have mercy. It's a bunch of y'all up in here. Give yourselves a round of applause and thank God for his goodness. I'm excited tonight. Not so much because I'm here. And not so much because you're here, but I'm excited tonight because Jesus is here. And in a time like this, we don't just need to be around each other. We need to be in the presence of the Lord. And if we would step into his presence tonight, I just believe that something would happen. A yoke would be broken and you'd go home and find things different than how it was when you left. I believe some, God's going to change some things at your house. Anybody need a change at your house? Shout out your address right out loud right now. Just shout. That's where we want the change. Right in your house. Right in your life. Right where you live. Right in your situation. Jesus didn't say, I come that you might have church. He said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Anybody ready to have abundant life? Clap your hands and thank God like you love him right now. I want to share this word with you. I want to invite your prayerful consideration to 2 Kings uh, chapter number 4. I've, I've been stuck in this passage a while. I can't get out of it. There's something in it for you tonight that I believe that God would have you share and have me extrapolate from the complexities of this text to the intent that we might go home endowed with a grace from God that would in fact enable us to simplify the chaotic circumstances that all of us deal with behind the mask of our religiosity. Sometimes you deal with things that you can't even let your own brothers and sisters know that you're going through. And you secretly cry out to God and say, God, do something for me. I, I love church, but sometimes going to church just don't cut it. You need something a little deeper. You need the touch of the Holy Spirit to do something in your life. But if there's anybody in here that knows he's able, give me a witness right now. A witness, a witness, a witness, a witness. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter number 4 beginning at verse 1 and we're going to go down to about verse 7. Thank you, Jesus. When you have it, say amen. Now, I know I'm not at the potter's house, but it's my custom and I would ask you to respect it tonight. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. 
I have a sense in my spirit tonight of prophetic urgency. I have not come as I would have come 20 years ago in the hopes that I might impress you and stand at the back door with my cards in hopes that I might get a booking. I have not come to make a name for myself. I do not seek lights or crowds anymore. I do not hunger for masses and numbers of people. I hunger for privacy and quiet and simple things. Iced tea on my grandmother's porch. Calm things. I do not seek the aggrandizement of human accolades because I have learned in my lifetime that they will say Hosanna today and crucify him tomorrow. But because of the times we're living in now, these are turbulent times unlike anything I have ever seen before. We can't come to church like we normally do and just sit up and cross our legs and look important because we got a devil to fight right now. I said, we got a devil to fight right now and we need a breakthrough from the Lord. And I sense that in this house tonight. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter number 4, beginning reading at verse 1. Then we're going to read down to verse 7. It's a very familiar passage of scripture, just very familiar. But just uh, indulge me tonight, if you will. If you have found it, say amen. Amen. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. Tell me now, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaiden have not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her and she poured out and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay thy debt. And live thou and thy children on the rest. Can you say amen? Mm. The second verse is where I would draw your attention for consideration tonight. Elijah says unto this distraught, disturbed, almost hostile woman, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? What hast thou in the house? Look at somebody that you love or respect and tell them as if they might not know, say, what you've been looking for is in the house. 
they, they, they might not believe you because they've been living in this situation so long that they may not trust you to know that there's something in the house that they have not seen. But find another neighbor and say, what you've been looking for is in the house. If you receive that, give God a praise right now. Now, Lord God, I invoke your presence. Bombard this place, if you will. Not for my name, but for yours. Not for my glory, but for yours. Not for me, but for these that you died for. Speak in this place today. Without you, we are impotent to perform, but by your grace, if you would stop by, we would go home well pleased tonight. Sir, we came tonight that we would see Jesus manifest yourself, oh God. I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' illustrious name we pray. Somebody who loves him, shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I believe that we cannot understand church or understand life or understand people until we begin to understand God. When we begin to seek wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not fear in the sense of terror or fright, but fear in the sense of reverence and respect. We begin to wise up the moment that we prioritize him and put him first. The very first thing that God teaches Moses in the book of Genesis is that he is an Elohistic God. That he is Elohim, in the beginning Elohim created, he's the creator, the heavens and the earth. He is a creator and if you have been created in his likeness, then you are creative, uniquely creative separate and apart from anything else that was created in the earth. Man has a unique ability to be creative like the God who created him. Think of in the last 200 years the amazing things that men have created. Technology. Look at all of the technology that we have today. Just a few hundred years ago, we didn't have automobiles or had not harnessed electricity. We, we didn't have the benefit of all of the technology that we have now. The telephone did not exist. The microphone did not exist. The microwave did not exist. Who knows what will be invented in the years to come because we are creative even without money, without resources, as I've traveled throughout the bush in Africa, they have shown me how they built houses out of, out of the dung from cows and branches and sticks and took wood and carved it into giraffes. If you put man anywhere, he will create something because he is created in the likeness and the image of God. The Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep and the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters and God said, Whenever he says something, something is going to happen. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said it was good. Before there was a choir to sing or an organ to play or a tambourine to beat. Before there was a praise ministry or praise dancer or praise books. Before there was anybody to praise him. God praised himself and said, it's good all by myself. He is the mighty God who stepped out on nothing and said, let there be something. And it became whatever he said because he's sovereign. He's absolutely in control. He totally reigns. He is omnipotent, all powerful, omnipresent in all places, at all times, omniscient, all knowing, not guessing, not wondering, not figuring, not computing. God already knows the end from the beginning, the answer before the question, the sum total before you figure out the equation he's God, he sits on the circle of the earth he has all power in his hand nobody elected him and nobody can impeach him he's God all by himself
Our God is an intelligent God. John begins to teach about it and he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That particular word there is logos to talk about the intelligence of God. That God is intelligent. He's not just powerful. Uh, electricity is power but it has no sense. He's not just forceful. Wind has force but it has no intelligence. But your God is intelligent. He is a strategic God. He is a thinking God. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a wisdom. He has a strategy. Oh my God. In the beginning was the strategy and the strategy was with God and the strategy was God and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Your God is strategic. He created everything in the book of Genesis from the beast of the field to the fish in the water to the birds of the air to the vegetation that grows up out of the ground. And the one thing that everything that he created had in common, the Bible says over and over again, whose seed is inside of itself. So he created everything living to be self-perpetuating so that he would not have to get up off of his throne and start creating again. He said, I'm going to do this one time and every time thereafter you will perpetuate your own existence by your own intrinsic discovery of what I have hidden down inside of you. I place treasure in the depths of your being, whether you're a dog or a cat or a fish or eagle or a snake or a frog. It doesn't make any difference. The ability to perpetuate yourself is hidden somewhere inside of yourself and whenever you find the seed you found the thing that you needed to perpetuate yourself think with me if you will in the 8th chapter of the book of Genesis the, the Bible says in the 25th verse while the earth remains there will always be summer and heat and day and night and sea time and harvest sea time and harvest is the strategy of God your God is strategic that's why you're still here he had a strategy when the enemy thought he had you surrounded God had a strategy when they meant it for evil God made it good because he had a strategy when you were crying over what happened yesterday and now you look back at it today and say Lord it was good for me that I've been afflicted that's all because God had a strategy determining the end from the beginning he has a strategy what the apostle Paul calls the manifold wisdom of God means God has has wisdom in his crevices, wisdom in the cracks of his garment, wisdom in the folds of his skirt. That's why the woman with the issue of blood said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, she touched his strategy, locked up in the folds of his priestly garment. I'm talking about your God and my God and our God. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts above our thoughts. He's already got a plan. And he's able to work it out. He did not create any living thing without the seed inside of itself. Look at your neighbor and say, there's something inside of me. <laughs> Self-perpetuating, self-producing, able to pollinate and cross-pollinate, produce and live and thrive. There is something inside of me. Now we know why the enemy fights you. It is not over what is on you, it's over what's in you. And if you were to discover what was in you, then everything around you would begin to change through the power of the audacity of self-discovery. I think we spend too much time trying to discern other people. For your deliverance, my brothers and sisters, will not come from discerning what is in me. Your deliverance will only come when you can discern what is inside of you. There is something in you that the enemy hates you for. He hates 
you over the hidden treasure that's locked up in the bowels of your spirit and you'll never escape your circumstances until you take inventory over what God is hidden inside of you and if you would ever loose the thing that God has hidden down inside of you the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain waiting on you to let yourself go oh. waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God the only hope then that the enemy has to paralyze your productivity is to cause you not to realize who you are intrinsically how can he then camouflage who you are intrinsically and internally? He does it by the external circumstances that grieve your heart, gradually convincing you that you have nothing in you that is productive, but the devil is alive. In fact, when you begin to suspect that there's something inside of you, you become attracted to be around other people who know that they have something inside of them. You cannot be mentored by somebody who is confused. You can oh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> you have to be mentored by somebody who is secure in who they are if you're mentored by somebody who is insecure the person who mentors you will turn around and try to kill you that's what's wrong with the church now we got too many Saul's trying to kill you and the only reason Saul is trying to kill you is that he dies without discovering who he really is you can't help me if you can't help you Oh, talk to me, somebody. I feel something in this room. Some of us are on the verge of exploding spiritually. We just need somebody to pass by us who knows who they are and know what they got and know what they can do. Think of Elijah plowing in the field behind the 12th yoke of oxen, plowing in the field of mediocrity, thinking in his own mind, I think I was created to do more than what I'm doing right now, but I can't quite unlock my destiny because I am stuck in my history fulfilling the prophecies of my parents waiting on something meaningful to happen in my life when all of a sudden Elijah walked past him and he saw something that made him drop his plow and burn his ox and set it all on fire kissing his mother and father goodbye he says I've got to follow this man I don't have to have a title I don't have to have credentials I don't have to have a salary I don't have to have a big name but I've got to follow you so you can show me how to unlock what I have inside of myself and then the old man says to the young man you have asked me a hard thing you can't get this glory easy. Do you know we're living in a generation now that people want your stuff easily? Stuff that you prayed for for 40 and 50 years. They want you to lay hands in 30 seconds and confer on them something that you agonized all your life for. But the devil is a lie. You have to walk with me and suffer with me and talk with me and endure hardness. And if you're still there, look at your neighbor and say, are you still there? Stop giving your glory to people who don't deserve it. Stop giving your wisdom to people who don't understand it. Stop 
casting your pearls before the swine. Stop giving it to these Johnny come lately wannabe people who want to get something easy that it took all your life to get and find somebody who will go through persecution and tests and trials and trauma and walk with you when you're not liked and walk with you when people hate you and if they're still there then release your glory somebody's about to get a release of glory in this place you've been praying for it you've been waiting on it it's about to happen give God some kind of praise any kind any Somebody holler, I'm on the verge of something. And, uh, sit with me. I haven't got to the text yet. <laughs> Elijah has something going that has provoked Elijah to leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. It is difficult to give up the familiar for the unfamiliar. We cleave to our traditions not because they're working. We cleave to them because they're comfortable. because they're safe because we understand them when you forsake the familiar for the unfamiliar there is a vulnerability and you have to have a certain humility to say I don't know how to do this I think one of the reasons that we gossip so and bicker so and fight so amongst ourselves is because we're bored You have nothing else to do but get in my business. There's nothing going on in your house, so you're all up in my Kool-Aid. Get out of my... <laughs> you know how Elijah follows Elijah until eventually he gets a double portion of his mentor spirit. He now begins to understand something that has taken me most of my life to realize. Most of my life I have been praying about situations to a God who moves in generations. <laughs> most of my life I have been praying about situations to a God who moves in generations. Israel understands this. The church doesn't understand this. Israel understands this because they know that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul teaches it the same faith that I saw on your grandmother Lois and on your mother Eunice. I now see it in you, Timothy. We spent too much time teaching generational curses. We should have been teaching generational blessings because there's a glory on you that God wants to perpetuate itself down to the next generation, but it will never happen if you don't know as a father who you are. You will pervert your son rather than empower your son because you're scared of your own seed. And a man cannot reproduce if he's scared of his own seed. Elijah was the recipient of Elijah's seed, his mantle, his glory, his vigor, his vim, his vitality, his tenacity. His auspicious grace, his wondrous anointing was so awe-spiring that this boy walked away from the familiar just to have a taste of the unfamiliar. 
to walk out on nothing but a promise from God and say, Lord, I'd rather be in the wilderness with you than to be in the palace with them. I want something to happen. People don't make those kinds of moves. We call them paradigm shifts. They don't make those kinds of moves unless they're hungry for God. People don't step off the boat with the disciples and step on the water unless there's something in front of them more important than what was behind them oh it's easy to stay out on the boat with the 11 who play it safe but every now and then God will send one who will say hey if it's you bid me to come and step from the familiar into the unfamiliar and say like Job though he slay me yet shall I trust him I trust you when I can't trace you I trust you when I don't understand you. I trust your wisdom when I don't know what in the world is going on in my life. I don't know how this goes together with that. But before it's over, I do know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Who are the call according to his purpose. When you see Elijah coming, you are seeing generations of glory. That's why he has double portions because glory accrues generationally. <laughs> He's walking in the full vesture, not only of what he has, but he's walking in the vesture of all those who taught them. He brings the power of ages and dispensations down through time. And if Elijah shows up in the house, Elijah is with him. For the spirit that Elijah has is nothing but a double portion of the one who taught him. You'll get it when you get home. So when he comes into this house, uh, somebody said, come on in the house. He comes into this house understanding the generational move of God. He comes into the house of one of the sons of the prophets. Perhaps he wants to share with this prophet like Elijah shared with him. But when he opens up the door, there is death in the house. There is death in the house. And the prophet is dead. And there's nobody left in the house but his wife and his sons who are about to be sold to the creditor and he comes in a house filled with pain. It is interesting to me. Jesus says when you go into a house and speak peace, if your peace does not abide, leave swiftly and shake the dust from your feet because there are atmospheres in houses. There are atmospheres in churches. If you've been preaching a while, you can walk in a room and tell what you got to deal with because you can feel the atmosphere before you ever get up. Have you ever gone someplace to minister and you said, oh Lord, it's going to be tough up in here tonight. You haven't even grabbed the mic yet, but you can feel the spirit in the house. Elijah walks in this house. There is no joy. There is no glory. There is no anointing. There is no hospitality. Nobody pours water on his hands. Nobody washes his feet. They don't even offer him a chair. When you walk into a house where there is more death than life, you hear more complaints then you hear praise. He opens the door of the house and not even so much as a hello, she immediately begins to regurgitate her own bitterness and says, my husband was a son of your prophets and my husband served the Lord and he died. What do you do when it looks like serving God doesn't work. 
oh, I know I hit something there. See, that's why I have a problem with testimony service. Because testimony service is where the saints get up and tell you how good they felt when it worked. I don't need you to tell me how to react when it works. I need you to tell me how to react when it's not working. I don't need you to tell me what to do when the check comes. I need you to tell me what to do when the check doesn't come. I don't need you to tell me how to shout when I get a job. I need you to teach me how to praise him when I lost my job. I don't need you to tell me how to rejoice when the tumor goes away, but I need you to tell me how to stand when the lump is still there. Is there anybody in this church who knows what I'm this woman was confused. She was worried. She was upset. She said, my husband did everything right. And it's not working. What do you do when you do what everybody taught you to do and it's not working? Seven steps to a blessing, five ways for a miracle, six ways to get out of debt, three ways to get prosperity. I spend around twice. I gave $19.99. I did what you said. What do you do? What do you do? When you're living right and praying and fasting and seeking God and the whoremonger and the liar and the hypocrite and the backbiter is going up higher. What do you do? When you've given him the best of your life and now in your older years you've fallen on the worst of times. This woman is bitter. She's angry. She's frustrated. And she pours out her grief on the prophet, not understanding who has come in her house. People don't know who you are. Oh, it's obvious for these that are sitting up front. But you don't have to be sitting up front to have an upfront anointing. Come on, somebody. You don't have to have a bunch of titles to have a bunch of glory. You don't have to have more degrees than a thermometer to have been with God. In fact, the glory that you see up here didn't start up here. It started way back there. She didn't know who was in her house. This might be bold, but look at your neighbor and say, you have no idea who I am. I believe that when you sit by the right person, you can get blessed just because you sat by the right person. If you shake hands with the right person, there's a glory that will fall on you just because you shook hands with the right person. I don't mind helping weak folk, but when I need a breakthrough, I want to sit by somebody that when I say hallelujah, they say hallelujah. When I say thank you, they say Jesus. When I say glory, they say to God. In fact, I feel like God wants to do something so strong in here tonight that if you think you're sitting by the wrong person, you ought to put up your finger and move somewhere else because before you go home, God wants to get some glory. Sit down, let me just talk to you. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit. I, I, I can't preach and hoop and holler and stuff, but I just want to, I just want to talk to you because I sense, I sense something about to happen. I sense a paradigm shift. I sense a change. It's, 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 it's everywhere. It's, it's all in the government. It's all in the nation. It's all in the church. It's all in the economy. Change is in the atmosphere. Something is shifted in the sea. Something has shifted in the spirit world. This ain't no time to faint. This is no time to give up. This is no time to die. 
Something is about to happen. Shout yeah! You sisters, you understand change. Y'all can change and look like completely different women. I got so many members in my church, I tried to learn all their names. And I told them, you know, when you see me, ask me, what's your name? Because I was trying to learn them all. And I couldn't do it. I asked why I said, don't ask me. No more. You remember me? I said, don't ask me. No more. Because sometimes I think I they'll change their hair. And, and Sally looked like April because she changed her hair. Women, women can change and turn into somebody else. <sighs> Go from short hair to long hair, long hair to flat hair, braids to a ponytail, ponytail to a fro. Y'all can change. Senator Obama says there's going to be change. Somebody shout change. But you see, brothers and sisters, what happened in this text and what's happening in our country and what's happening in our church is more than a subtle change. The adding of lipstick, the, the, the implementation of powder or blush, it's more than a subtle change. This is a total makeover. The, 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 this is a stomach stapling I lost 200 pounds you can't even tell who I am changed this is a paradigm shift a paradigm shift is when so much change has happened that all the structures have to change attitudes have to change rhetoric has to change a paradigm shift shuts your mouth for a while because you don't even know what to say about it all the rules have changed whenever God comes into your house something is going to shift somebody holler shift Elijah walks in the house filled with bitterness filled with hostility filled with fear filled with debt they were about to sell her sons to the creditors now that's debt she's in deep debt so bad that she's run out of all options. You don't, you don't sell your sons on a whim. When you get down to the point that you're ready to sell the kids, you would think you had tried everything possible before you offered up your children. So I am convinced that this woman thought that she had no alternatives. The Lord sent me all the way from Dallas, Texas to preach to somebody who thinks you've run out of alternatives. You think you don't have another option. You think you've tried everything that you could try and you think you're stuck in your situation. But the Lord made me fly in here to tell you that he's getting ready to rock your world, change your situation and pull you out. If I'm talking to you, give him a praise right now. In fact, get your prophecy man alone and look at somebody and say, things are about to change in my life. Things are about to shift in my life. I mean, a 180 degree turn around. I'm about to turn into something. You're not going to recognize me when I come out of this. Let me, let me work on this. I just want to work on this a little bit more. Can I work on this? Can I work on this? I want to work on it. I want to work on it. I want to work on it. I want to. So he comes into it and he, he shifts it with two questions. He said, what am I to do for thee? This first question she never answers because this question is too big for a depressed mind to respond to. There is a level of depression that will not allow you to receive a message of faith because you cannot receive what you cannot conceive. 
You can't talk to a woman who's getting ready to sell her children and say, what am I to do for thee? And her readily respond because she is sure that she has no options. So she never answers that question. So in the absence of an answer to that question, he submits another question. Bishop Owens, he says to her, what is in your house? What is in your house? His second question says, you have not discerned what's in your house. Wait a minute, I live in this house. You just got here and you're gonna come in here and tell me what's in my house? That is precisely the problem. When you live in the house, you discern divine things to be common. When you live in a house with gifts like Kim Burrell, you won't really respond when she sings. Because <laughs> you've gotten used to it. And it's common to you. It's a dangerous thing to get used to a divine gift because you won't extrapolate the full content out of it because you've been stepping over it and calling it ordinary when God has touched it and called it extraordinary. What is in your house? She said, well, it's nothing in here but a pot of oil. What the prophet is trying to teach her is that God will always use something that you already have. He will not go to the store to feed the 5,000. He will use the two fish and five loaves of bread that they already have. He will not destroy the giant with somebody else's armor. He'd rather use a rock and a rag that you have than use a shield and a sword that came from somebody else. I don't know who I'm talking to, but your blessing is not going to come from anybody else. Your blessing is going to come from you discovering what God put inside of you. Lay your hands on your stomach and say, there's something inside of me something I've been stepping over, something I've been walking over, something I've been ignoring, something I haven't been utilizing. What is in your house? She says, I don't have anything in this house except a pot of oil. A pot of oil. Two things, a pot and oil. Two things that have come together, a pot of oil. Now the oil is in the pot. The pot and the oil is container and content. The pot is the container, the oil is the content. God will always work with containers and contents. Two things, when you understand the container and you understand the content, you can unlock the miracle. She says, I don't have anything except a container and content. God will always use a container and content. That's why he told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. They were containers. <laughs> when he said the Holy Ghost, that was the content. And whenever a container has found its content, a miracle will happen in that place. Whenever a container has found its content, woman, if you believe on me, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's some in you. Can I go down this road a little further? It is the paradoxical dilemma between container and content that often exacerbates the problem in your life because you become so preoccupied with the frailty of the container that you never appreciate the value of the content. When we have this treasure, in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. Oh, the container may not look like much, but you ought to see the content that I got down inside of me. If you're filled up with content, shake somebody's hand and say, it's in me right now, it's in me right now. Now watch this, I'm trying to hurry through this, but let me, let me show you something. He says to a woman whose house 
he walked into who is deeply in debt and she comes to him about her debt. He says to the woman who's in debt, tell your sons that you're about to sell for your debt to go to your neighbors and borrow some vessels. Wait a minute. She's in debt. And you told her to go borrow. I was about to launch a project that is going to take about $200,000 to launch a gospel project, about $200,000 to market it and produce it and, and, and pay everybody you've got to pay. But I was looking for an investor. A particular man came to me and said, I'm interested in investing. So we began to talk about it. I was going real good. Great dinner, nice restaurant, good conversation. And then I was easing up on the money, you know. Because you ease up on it, you know, you don't just hit it. You don't bring it up with the salad. You wait till the dessert has come about the dessert. You say, you know, you say, and it's going to be about $200,000. I thought he would be shocked, a little nervous, but I thought I would get it before it was over. He said, excuse me, he said, Bishop J.C. He said, uh, you've got the wrong man. I said, I do. He said, yes. He said, we invest, but we normally begin our investments at around $5 million. He said, call me when you need more. And I started to say, well, I can get some more artists and I can get some more, you know, I, my mind started working quick. The problem was he had more resource than I had need. And he said, if you can increase your need, then I will release my resource. In other words, you're not in enough trouble to attract my glory to be released. But if you go out and get in some more trouble, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm talking to somebody. God's about to do something, and he sent me to tell you it's bigger than you think it is. It's greater than you think it is. He's going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all ye may ask or think. Give him praise right now. And he says, Bishop, he says, borrow the vessels. And he says, borrow not a few. Because when this starts happening, it's going to be big. When this door opens, it's going to be huge. When this flow starts, it's going to be supernatural. When it does open up, it's going to be on another level. That's why the devil's trying to discourage you before you get the release. Because the enemy knows that your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, neither has entered into your heart the things that God has prepared for you. In fact, you need to enlarge your cords and strengthen your stakes and get ready for a big thing. You've been praying about a little thing, but you need to ask. God for a big thing. Hey, is anything too hot? So, mm, mm. If you happen to be lucky enough to be sitting beside somebody with some faith, shake their hand and tell them it's bigger than you think it is. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger than you think it is. It's bigger than you think it is. That's why the devil's been fighting you. Because it's bigger than you think it is. That's why all hell's been breaking loose in your life. Because it's bigger than you think it is. That's why the enemy's been trying to discourage you. Because it's bigger than you think it is. That's why you've been having trouble in your house. Because it's bigger than you think it is. That's why the enemy's been trying to encamp around you. Because it's bigger than you think it is. That's why the Lord wanted you to come to convocation. Because it's bigger than you think it is. Somebody just barely got here. It was hard for you to get here. But God wanted you to get this word. It's bigger than you think that it is. It, 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 it. The reason I'm getting happy right now 
is because what I'm thinking to myself is devil you should have killed me when you had the chance but it's too late now it's too late now I already sense a release coming in the spirit I haven't even gotten it yet but I can tell it's about to break loose somebody praise God for what he's about to do Pray them for what he's about to do. Pray them for what he is about to do. Pray them. Pray them till you forget what you look like. Pray them till you forget what you've been through. Pray them uh, till you come out of your depression. Pray them uh, till you come out of your fear. Pray them. Pray them, church. Pray them right now. People say it's bigger, it's bigger, it's bigger, it's, it's bigger, 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 it's bigger than you think it is, it's bigger than you think it is, it's greater than you think it is. He's got more for you. Open your mouth and shout on the God. in the balcony shout up in the top you made it in this house you ought to shout somebody didn't get in here but God let you get in here open your mouth preach this thing. Shake hands with somebody and say, something is about to happen. You're about to get a flow. You're about to get a breakthrough. Don't die. Don't collapse. Don't faint. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give out. Something is about to flow. 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 Let me, let me show you something. There's a principle. He says, when you get the empty vessels, bring them in and shut the door. Shut the door. Somebody say, shut the door. See, when you get ready to get a miracle, you got to shut out every doubt, shut out every fear, shut out every negative person. That's right, sometimes you got to shut folks out because the wrong folk will mess up your vision. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but you got to shut the door. The folk you're around now can't handle what God is about to do in your life. You got to get this word and shut the door. Look at somebody say, shut it, shut it, shut it. Sally, you can't come in. Mary, you can't get in here. Tawana, you got to go. Shut the door and when they shut the door supply watch this supply flowed into demand supply flowed into demand God is attracted to capacity 
the greater the capacity, the greater the flow. You remember when the matter fell down from heaven? He didn't give everybody the same amount of loaves. The people who could eat more got more. For he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That's why folk are jealous of you right now. Because you want more. God's giving you more. But ain't no need in you hating on us because we want something you don't want. Somebody came to the convocation because they're hungry for a move of God. You don't care what anybody thinks. You want a touch from God. Wherever you are, make some noise right now. She said she had one pot of oil, but she didn't understand that it was a bottomless pot. And as long as there was demand, supply would continue to flow. There was so much in her house that she hadn't touched that as long as they could bring an empty vessel, the oil continued to flow. You think you've been blessed. You ain't seen nothing yet. God said, tip it over some more. Oh! He said, I got more in the pot than you think I do. I got more miracles. I got more people coming. I got more favor coming. I've got more resources coming. But you've got to get in the position of the flow. And all of a sudden, as long as there was capacity, there was flow. And the flow continued and continued. And everything full got set aside. Everything full got set aside. Our problem is we sit in church with full folks. Full folks don't want anything from God. And what you need to do is set them full folk aside and get over with somebody that's hungry and say, you know what, man, I'm hungry. I want something else from God. I'm too old to sit up here and let this moment pass me by. Bishop Porter, I need a breakthrough from God right now. Is there anybody hungry for a breakthrough from God? Make some noise in this place right now. And the oil begin to flow it begin to flow it begin to flow it begin to flow it begin to flow and it poured out and it poured out and as long as there was emptiness in front of it there was flow coming out of it as long as there was demand there was supply as long as there was capacity there was filling and when they could find no more demand then the oil stayed I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. But I want you to understand something. There's a miracle in your house. Stand up on your feet for a minute. Stand up on your feet. If you're able to stand. If you, you don't feel like standing, sit. But if you're able to stand, stand. There's a miracle in your house. In this house. There's a miracle in this house. There's a miracle in your church house. There's a miracle in your national church house that you've been stepping over as common and ordinary. And people can never operate in an environment where they are handled as ordinary. Even Jesus could do no mighty works in certain places because they treated him as if he were ordinary. <laughs> in order for the oil to flow, you have to respect the pot it comes from. If you don't respect the pot enough, to put it in a position to flow, you will stop the blessing, not because you don't have it, but because you won't properly position it to do 
what God sent it to do. And you say, what are you doing coming in here talking to us about that? You don't live here. Elijah didn't live there either. He came from the outside to the inside. Because sometimes folk on the outside can see things that the people on the inside cannot see. What is in your house? They tilted the oil, and the oil began to flow. Listen at me, I'm almost finished. I'm not really trying to make you shout. I want to make you see something. There's something you've been stepping over that God's going to use to bring you out. The oil is about to flow. The oil is about to flow and it's going to come from something you already have. God will always use something that you already have. Watch this. It was oil, right? Oil comes from the olive. The olive, in order to release the oil, must be crushed. The greater the crushing, the greater the oil. If you want to see a real flow of the Holy Spirit, stop fooling with these folks who haven't been through anything. You are not going to get a flow from people who have not been crushed. The real flow of glory will always come from somebody who's been crushed. If you're sitting by somebody who's been crushed, there will be a flow of oil that will come out of them like you have never seen before. Some of you have gone through something in the last year that crushed you. You thought you couldn't take it. You thought it was going to kill you. You felt like throwing up your hands. You thought you were about to die. But God wasn't killing you. He was crushing you. And the all that's about to come out of your life is beyond anything you have ever seen before. Somebody shout, let it flow. Don't you see the synergy between the oil and the woman? They've both been crushed. This isn't just about oil. No. It's about crushings and breakings and bruisings and pain. And the very thing you hide from people is the very thing God wants to use. They've been asking you, how are you? And you've been talking about, I'm blessed, I'm fine, I'm doing good. You don't want anybody to know you've been crushed. But your oil is in your crushing. You paid a price for this oil. You went through something for this oil. You agonized for this oil. And now God's about to let it flow. One more thing. The Bible said, she poured out. She poured out. Now I know how convocations are. Not just this one, all of them. People come, they don't really pour out because you don't want to pour out. You don't want to pour out. You don't want anybody to know that you came here on life support. I'm going to ask you something. Have you ever been preaching tired? Have you ever been trying to revive folks and secretly want to quit? Have you ever been trying to help people and, and been tired of the people you're trying to help? 
Have you ever been at your wit's end and you didn't know what to do and there you are giving wisdom to other people and they're walking off and getting blessed? Have you, have you ever encouraged people and went home discouraged and wish you had somebody to encourage you like you encourage other people? There's something in you that God wants to flow out. This woman poured out. And as she poured out, she came out of her pain. She came out of her situation. And she came out of her debt. Her finances got released. Everything around her got released because of something that was in her. There is something in you right now that if you would let it out, it would change everything around you. Now watch this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of your way. I want you to do something for me. I want you to join hands with somebody else in this room. Get them by the hand. Take them by the hand. And when you take them by the hand, don't think about them. Think about all the things you've been through. Think about the stuff you can't tell anybody. Think about the things you held your peace about. Think about how God kept you when you felt like throwing your hands up in the air. Think about how he gave you sleep when you went to bed crying at night and think about how he brought you through the storm and the rain. And every time you think of something God brought you through, oil is beginning to gather. Oil is beginning to gather. It's going to hit your finances. It's going to hit your body. It's going to hit your life. It's going to hit your situation. There's still some oil in you you haven't used yet. I know the devil's been telling you you're too old, but the devil is a lie. God kept you here because you still got oil in you. Squeeze that hand you're holding. Yes. 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 Somebody's pouring out. 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 You got an anointing down in you. Beneath your pressure, beneath your pain, beneath your turmoil, God's going to get some glory out of this. Squeeze that hand. The oil, the oil, the oil is flowing. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, let it flow. Let it flow. Somebody's getting healed. Somebody's getting delivered. Somebody's getting set free. Somebody's getting attached. Yes, yes, yes. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Lord, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, you're comforting me. My cup, my cup, my cup runneth over. Let it run over. Let it run over. Yes, 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 yes. The anointing destroys the yoke the yoke is broken the yoke is broken spirits of depression spirits of fear spirits of death spirits of disease it's broken it's broken you paid a price for it you paid a price for it you cried for it you were lonely for it you went to bed by yourself for it. You rocked yourself to sleep for it. But here comes the glory. Get a hold of that hand. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil 
that fell upon the head of Aaron onto his beards, onto his skirts. For there God commandeth a blessing, even life, even life, even life. I rebuke death, even life forevermore. Squeeze that brother's hand, squeeze that sister's hand. They've been through hell. They can't tell you. They can't talk about it. They can't open up, but they've been through hell. They came here in pain. They left trouble at the house. They going home to deal with situations, but God's going to get some oil flowing in your life. You're going to go home with the anointing on you. You're going to get on the plane speaking in tongues. The glory of the Lord is in this place. The glory of the Lord is in the video shop. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. Lift your hands and open your mouth. Open your mouth wide and let praise fill this place. I said let praise fill this place. Forget about your title. Open your mouth. God wants to fill you with glory. Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, let it flow from the balcony to the next balcony, down to the floor, let it flow from sister to sister, from brother to brother, from bishop to bishop, from elder to elder, from pastor to pastor, let it flow, let it flow. When you leave here, you got to go back and fight that devil. Receive this flow. I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if she would have borrowed more vessels. I wonder how much oil would have flowed if she would have gotten more capacity. And I wonder how much more God would do if you would let the glory flow. out of you flow flow just flow don't murmur don't complain just flow don't worry don't doubt just flow to let it flow you came up letting it flow before people worried you to death you let it flow let it flow again let it flow again
Where are my worshipers? Take over this house. Where are my worshipers? Take over this house. Worshipers, take over this house. Take over this house. Where are my worshipers? Take over this house. Shake yourself loose and take over this house. Here comes the glory flowing on you. Depression, you gotta go. Anger, you gotta go. Fear, you gotta go. Disease, you gotta go. Worry! Worry! You gotta go. You gotta go. I'm struggling. I, I don't know your protocol. I don't want to be out of order. But I feel glory in this place. I feel glory in this place. I feel the anointing of the Lord in this place. Anybody feel the anointing of the Lord in this place? Lift your hands if you feel the anointing of the Lord in this place. Brother, I want to lay my hands on you. Can I just lay my hands on you? I got such an anointing just to lay my hands on you. I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what you've been dealing with. But God's going to anoint your head with oil. Your cup's going to run over and no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. If I lay my hands on you today, God said he's going to seal some things. How? How? Shut up. Hey! 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 I don't call shut up. Hey! Somebody help him praise him. Somebody help him praise him. Somebody help him. Oh, oh, oh. I feel glory. I feel glory. I want to lay my hands on you. I don't know what you've been through. But out of the bruisings and out of the struggles and out of the pain and out of the being walked over and walked around and walked past, comes a fresh release. How? Oh! How? Somebody help him. Somebody help him. Somebody help him. Somebody, come on, church. Come on, just a minute. Just a minute. Help him. Help him. Just a minute. Help him. Just a minute. Help him. Just a minute. I feel glory in this place. Open your mouth and give God glory in this place. Come on and give God glory in this place. Come on and give God glory in this place. Come here, baby. Come here, honey. Come here, honey. Come here, baby. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Sister, we got an anointing for you. Come get this anointing. Come walk into this anointing. There. How? Oh! Come get this anointing. Hey! Come get this anointing. Come get this anointing. For all the pain. 
for all the suffering, for all the agony. The oil is about to flow. Lift your hands and just let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. God has not forgotten you. Let it flow. Let it flow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I bless your name tonight. I bless your name. I bless your name tonight. I bless your name. I bless your name. I bless your name. Receive. Receive. Shut the How? How? Glory. Oh my God. Where are my worshipers at? Where are my worshipers? Where are my worshipers at? Touch your body. Touch your body. Touch your body. Touch your body. Touch. 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 Touch, touch, touch. How? 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 Hey, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Somebody help mama praise him. Somebody help mama praise him. Somebody help mama praise him. Somebody out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Lift your hands and let it flow. It's flowing out. It's flowing out. It's flowing out. 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 Let it flow. 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 You're ready for it. You've been waiting on it. You've been praying for it. Here it is. How? Somebody help her praise him. Somebody help her praise him. Somebody help her praise him. Let's go back to the old time way. Come on, let's go back to the old time way. Come on, let's go back, church. Come on, church. Church. Oh. 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 Oh, mama. Oh. Let's go back. 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 Ow! Oh! Let it flow. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in here. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in here. Hallelujah. I can't reach you up in that balcony, but if you'd open your mouth and begin to praise him, a fresh anointing would come in your spirit. A fresh anointing would come. Hey, yes, Lord. A fresh, a fresh, a fresh anointing. Receive it! Receive it! Receive it! The oil is flowing. The oil is flowing. The oil is flowing. The oil is flowing. Listen, church. Get one person by both hands. And just for 60 seconds, I want you to pray a Holy Ghost blessing on them with all of your might, with all of your strength. For 60 seconds, just get them by both hands and let it just flow. 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 Come on, you got 40 seconds left. Get him. Come on, you got 40 seconds left. Come on, you got 30 seconds left. Come on, let it flow. Come on, for 30 seconds, let it flow. For 25 seconds, let it flow. Let it flow. Ow! 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 You got 15 seconds. 10.
Somebody give him the praise. I feel victory in him. I feel victory in him. I feel victory. I feel victory. Anybody got the victory? Anybody got the victory? Anybody got the victory? Excuse me a minute. You got to give me some room. I'm going to give him some praise. Go ahead and pray. Y'all ain't gonna never have me back. Let me act right. Oh! You got him. Huh? I feel some victory in here, y'all. Anybody got a victory shout? Anybody got a victory shout? Anybody got? Anybody got? Anybody got? 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 Got it! I got it! I'm going to show you something and I'm going to sit down. Listen at me real good. He told the woman to sell the oil. In other words, it's a law of reciprocity. It's a higher law than seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest means if you sow apples, you reap apples. Reciprocity means you can sow one thing and reap another. He said, you need money, you got oil, but God will trade with you. If you've got the anointing, God said, I'll trade with you and I'll cause you 
to prosper and be in good health as your soul anybody got a prosperous soul make some noise if you got a prosperous soul when you go home you're going to sell the oil you're going to trade the oil you're going to give what you do have so you can get what you don't have and God said, you got so much, you're going to live off the rest. Oh, my God, do you hear what I'm saying to you? <laughs> Quickly, just, just for a point of contact, I want everybody that can, you might not be able, but everybody that's got $21, get it in your hand real fast, $21.